I'll tell you what, I really waffled on what to call this episode of the show. I'm not an expert on making titles on SEO or making these things really searchable or, or easy to find or, or, or wordsmithing anything. That, that's not what I'm, what I'm capable of doing at this point in the show. But I landed on this title, How the Bible Made an Evangelical Seminary Professor Catholic. This week, I'm joined by none other than Dr. Douglas Beaumont, who taught at Southern Evangelical Seminary, who went there, who was steeped in the world of evangelical apologetics, and became Catholic. He has a number of fantastic books. In fact, he wasn't the only one to become Catholic from SES. He has a whole book of other converts and their stories on why they became Catholic at this particular school. But it's a fantastic episode, really. Doug's deal was the Bible. And essentially, at the core, if, if we can't say how the Bible came to be put together, then, then how can we trust the Bible? And listen, Doug will unpack this for you, but he dug deeply. He asked the experts in evangelical Christianity this question and came up short. Came up with the Catholic Church as the thing that had the answers. And it's a great conversation. I really hope you like it. That's what it is this week. How the Bible Made an Evangelical Seminary Professor Catholic. Super catchy title, eh? I don't know. I hope you enjoy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us again this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. If you are tuning in on podcast only, check us out on YouTube at youtube.com slash the cordial Catholic. Or if you want to watch, uh, to listen to this only and not, and watch us, we're also available on podcasts everywhere you can find, uh, find podcasts. Wonderful conversation for you this week. I am joined by none other than Dr. Douglas Beaumont. Uh, Dr. Beaumont is a convert to the Catholic faith. He has a master's degree from Southern Evangelical Seminary, a PhD from Northwest University. He is a, an author, a catechist, a popular speaker, the author of some fantastic books, including uh, Evangelical Exodus, which he contributed to and edited, a collection of of conversion stories from his fellow seminarians at uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary, a fantastic collection of conversion stories, and with one accord just out from Catholic Answers Press recently, a fantastic book which looks at Catholic Protestant topics through a Protestant lens, through, through Protestant topics through a Catholic lens to really help Catholics to understand the, the Protestant, how <laughs> Protestants understand the Catholic perspective. I'm glad you're here, Doug, to help me through with what you have written. You're doing fine. It's all, it's all of that and more. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I got to say this, we're on, we're on great terms here, Doug, because you are, you have the dubious honor of being the very first guest on this show, back when I recorded this thing uh, on a toaster with an extension cord. And you are now, I think, the most, the, the most uh, appeared guest as well on this show. So welcome, Doug. Thank you for being here once again. And, and hello. I just want to say, Jimmy A can eat your heart out. <laughs> it's true. He's close behind you, so so watch your back. <laughs> you I'm, watching, I'm watching. He's in the rear view. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, no, it's great to be here. I, I love your show, and it's uh, always a blast. So We have a good time. And you know what? It, it occurred to me recently, I've had you on a number of times for different reasons, all kinds of reasons. I had you talking about the idea of a paradigm shift very early on the show, how someone goes from Protestant to Catholic. You've been on here uh, with Devin Rose, actually, talking about the, the two of you and your kind of relationship and how you guys um, became Catholic kind of together and bounce ideas off of each other and, and how that all worked. Very popular episode. Of course, you've been on here talking about your, your new book with One Accord, the idea of these how we can explain to Protestants these Catholic ideas using Protestant language. I've had you on here also on infant baptism, I think, before. A fantastic episode. You really you really hit that one out of the water. I still refer back to some of the arguments that you taught me in that episode when I had those conversations with people. So, great staying power. But I haven't had you on the show talk about your own conversion story, which I love. It's a great one. Really interesting. So, here we are. And I kind of want to get out of the way at first and give you some space here to unpack your journey, Doug. And if we can, begin as early as you want to begin. And then as we go, we'll unpack some of the things that you encountered along the way and we'll, we'll dig deeper into those. But where did you begin in faith? Were, were you raised uh, a Protestant Christian? Was that something that you came into? Uh, where do we begin? Well, let's turn to Genesis 1. And uh, <laughs> there we read. Um, yeah, so no, I, I wasn't raised a Christian. Um, I was 
you know, nominally moral type American upbringing. Um, my mom and I would say prayers at night and that kind of thing, but we weren't, you know, we weren't even really like priesters, right? We didn't even really go on Christmas and Easter. Very, very rarely would we go to church. I, I actually remember the first time that she said we were going to go to church on Easter and I couldn't believe it on Easter, you know, <laughs> like, why in the world would we waste our time at church on Easter? Um, so when I was in high school, I guess you would call me kind of an agnostic. Um, I, I don't think I would have even known what that word meant. Um, but I did know some Christians. I knew some Mormons that were good friends of mine. And we used to argue a lot and, and just, uh, I was just this very vague agnostic. That's probably the best way to put it. I, I didn't have any really good arguments. Um, basically, I just thought, well, you know, people used to think the world was flat and people used to think that, you know, Zeus hurled lightning from the sky. So, you know, now we've got 3000 different religions in the world. So, uh, who, who can, who can, who would be so egotistical to say that, that they knew which one of them was true. Now, of course, all of this was basically just so that I could sin. Um, I wouldn't have put it that way, but you know, deep down my, my disinterest really wasn't because I wasn't interested in the truth. I've always been kind of fanatical about, um, knowing the truth and reality and this sort of thing. But I really honestly, deep down, just didn't think it was worthy to pursue because I just didn't think you could ever spend enough time, learn enough about all the different religions to make a really informed choice. And uh, of course, you know, deep down, I was kind of enjoying my life and I didn't really want uh, any religions to mess that up. So um, that's how I graduated. I mean, I, I, I was an adult. I was on my way to college and the summer in between high school and college, I got a job at a Christian summer camp, which is its own rather hilarious story. <laughs> um, really not entirely sure why they hired me. Um, half my application form was blank because it was, you know, we need a letter from your pastor and we need to know this and that. And I just kept flipping the pages and mailed it off. Um, but I guess God's hand was on it because I actually got hired as a counselor. And the first week of the summer was spent training the counselors yeah. how to teach the kids about the Christian faith. And I, I literally had this like huge conversion experience, you know, right there at the camp. Um, I had recently become something of a theist, which is a whole other story. I, I don't want to get into now. Um, but there, there was some miraculous stuff involved and it was really crazy. So I was kind of getting nailed down that year. And by the time the summer was over, I'd spent a whole summer with all these great Christian folks. And, uh, I came back home a Christian and, and for the next, uh, gosh, 20 years, I was just kind of your basic evangelical, you know, Calvary Chapel, um, you know, meeting in the movie theater, meeting in the uh, middle school <laughs> kind of church goer. Um, and that really took me all the way up until I got married and my wife and I moved to North Carolina so that I could learn the faith at Southern Evangelical Seminary. <laughs> wow. So, Pretty awesome conversion story. Similar to my conversion story, actually, I mine was in high school a little earlier on than than yours, I guess. But really, yeah, a miraculous kind of conversion, and and I became really immersed and in love with the Bible and and with Scripture. So obviously, you decided to study at a, at a master's level at Southern Evangelical Seminary. You decided to go and pursue pursue studying faith really seriously. So when you became evangelical, was it an immediate kind of like uh, uh, on fire for the faith that just led you right into wanting to go to, to the Bible college kind of thing? Or was it something that happened that you really want to dig deeper and, and that's why you first applied to, uh, to SES? Like how did that process happen? Yeah, so that was that was about a decade really of, uh, of time that passed there. I, I went off to college and started in with this Baptist college group because it was just like literally like the first Christian I met on campus invited me and that became my ministry for the next three to five years. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I knew that was going to be very important to me, and, and this has been a thread through my whole life really, was that it, it, was, it was a couple of people who really answered my questions that kind of dislodged my agnosticism and made me open my mind to think about God as actually existing and that there might actually be a religion that represented him correctly. And if it hadn't been for those people, I don't know that I ever would have really opened my mind to those kinds of things. So really the summer camp experience was kind of, I was already sort of converted. I just didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what to do yeah. with myself yet. Um, but in the months preceding that, I, I had run into somebody at where I worked and a chimney sweep of all people. And um, 
they had witnessed to me, you know, the way evangelicals like to do. And I pulled out my dumb little agnostic arguments and they absolutely hammered me. <laughs> I mean, I was, and it was two in a row, which is hilarious. Uh, I, I tried it on two different people and both times I, I just got my lunch handed to me um, or eaten or whatever it is that happens when you lose really <laughs> badly. And I, I distinctly remember, um, you know, going to bed one of those nights and just thinking, you know, all of what I thought were good reasons to not be in the faith are gone now. Like now at this point, I am choosing not to believe. And that was a very scary position to be in. So fast forward to college and I wanted to be that guy. You know, I wanted to be the person who, when I said, Hey, I'm a Christian and they laughed or said they were agnostic, whatever else. I wanted to be the guy that ate their lunch. (laughs) I wanted to be, you know, the chimney sweep to to the people in my college. So I just kind of dove right into apologetics. Um, And, you know, when you're in college, of course, everybody's, you know, we're still teenagers. um, And it didn't take very long for me to, you know, get, you know, this much more knowledge and instantly become the expert of of the whole campus, right? Um, So people started telling me, oh, you should go to seminary, you should go to seminary, you'd be really great. Well, the trouble is, all I knew about seminary was that that's where people went who wanted to be pastors, or who wanted to be missionaries. And I had no desire to be either one. (laughs) Uh, you know, we, I had pastors, they'd, they'd read, you know, half a verse of scripture and talk about it for 45 minutes. And I just thought that will never be me. I'll never be able to, to, to do that. Um, and I liked America and I liked fast food and, you know, I didn't want to be living in Africa or somewhere. You know, God always sends everyone to Africa, you know, if, if they're at all faithful. Um, so the seminary just didn't really make a lot of sense for me. Um, but when I graduated college, I had my bachelor's and somebody got me some books by Norman Geisler for my graduation present. I'd been listening to the Bible answer man, Hank Hanegraaff, um, pre orthodox wink conversion. Um, and I'd heard Norm Geisler on the show and he just blew my mind. Um, and so I started reading his books and I found out that he had started a seminary in North Carolina for people like me, people that wanted to become apologists, people that wanted to defend the faith, people that wanted to learn philosophy, and that was about it. I mean, my, my decision making went about that far. <laughs> and uh, I was dating my uh, current wife at the, at the time, as if I have like other wives, my <laughs> wife, whom I have right now. Um, and I told her, I said, hey, listen, uh, if this whole thing works out, we're going to be moving to North Carolina in a year or so. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> And that just, that's what we did. So, and you know, still, never, yeah, you still have, I'm surprised you still have her, but that's, yeah. 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 So she, she stuck with me and oh, uh, so it really wasn't until I was almost 30 that we finally, you know, we got married, got everything settled, moved across the country and got started. So, you know, I was kind of a late bloomer as far as the academics go. So, I, you know, a solid decade had passed from the time that I had become a Christian, got really solidly into the evangelical Baptist world. And then, uh, moved to North Carolina to start studying at SES. I think the really interesting and important thing there to underscore for me, uh, Doug, is that you really intentionally chose to go there and chose, so you didn't just kind of stumble into this. You were serious about apologetics. You chose this school because you really bought into, the, I mean, Norm Geiser, the founder and the philosophy that they were, that he was, he started that school under, right? You were really embedded in that and intentionally chose to, to go there to be this evangelical, apologist uh i it wasn't you didn't just kind of stumble into it and stumble into apologetics okay so so what happens <laughs> you get there and um what do you find well um to, to kind of bounce off your your last uh, statement what, what i found was two trailers in a gravel parking lot <laughs> <laughs> and this old guy walking around in shorts uh <laughs> Meet Norm Geisler, you know, I'm like, I just moved 3000 miles and we meet in a trailer. Like what's happening here? But the good news is I was evangelical. So I'm used to churches and schools and weird places. So it wasn't a big deal. Um, but, you know, I will say that at, at that time, this is, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, SES was really like a place for the hardcore. Um, th- there was no denominational standing. It wasn't attached to any university. It wasn't attached to any church. I mean, it was 100% Norm Geisler's pet project. (laughs) There were like three people that taught there. Um, I don't think we had 50 students. Um, 
And really, I mean, like the only reason anybody went there was because they wanted to learn from Norman Geisler, from Tom Howe. Um, and these guys are writing these amazing apologetics books and be like them. I mean, that's, that's why you went there. There was literally no good reason to go to SES <laughs> except that. Um, so yeah, everybody there was, was, was in, I mean, we were in with, with both feet jumping in. Um, we worked really hard and I was there when the school transitioned from the trailer to the new building. I mean, I literally used to like walk, you know, climb up the ladders when nobody was there and take pictures of the guts and everything. And, um, so it, it was a, it was a heady time to be there. Um, and one of the things I discovered pretty early on was that Norm Geisler's brand of apologetics was very heavy on philosophy. Now I didn't have any kind of philosophical background. Um, my very first class, the very first time I stepped into a classroom at SES, I was late, which was embarrassing. Um, but I got to sit next to Tom Howe, uh, Tom Howe's brother, Richard Howe, who we're now good friends. And I, I love that guy. But Norm Geisler's up there talking about Plato and the Demiurge and the, you know, the dudes about being drawn circles and arrows and everyone's kind of nodding along like this and taking notes. And my jaw just hit the floor, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, I thought I was going to learn about like Mormons and stuff, you know, like what is happening right now? And uh, come to find out that, you know, Norm Geisler really made a big part of his mark on the world um, by his love of Thomas Aquinas. So he, he kind of brought the Catholic St. Thomas Aquinas and his philosophy into the apologetics world of, you know, the Western hemisphere in the uh, 20th century. And so everybody at SES was learning a lot from not only Thomas Aquinas, but also a lot of his commentators who of course were almost 100% Catholic. So what was odd was, you know, you'd have all these little Baptist boys uh, walking around with, you know, Charles Ryrie under one arm and the Summa in the other and we didn't think anything of it, <laughs> you know, being a dispensational Baptist Thomist would, yeah, that's just what we do here. You know, um, of course, when you're surrounded by it, it doesn't seem quite as bizarre as it is. Um, but it didn't take long for, I think, some of the fruit of that to start uh, blooming, blooming, D does fruit bloom? I, I do think ripen? it does bloom. Yeah, I think it does. I should have gone with ripen. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, you can edit that out or just leave it in. It's yeah, kind of funny. Let's edit that out. Uh, it's not as funny as me putting the T-shirt on the chair, but um, <laughs> you know, we started losing some people. You know, we started losing some people to Catholicism, and you know, Dr. Geisler at the time, and, and even I, I think right now still uh, had the the best book written by an evangelical on the Catholic Church. Um, it's a really long title: Roman Catholics and Evangelicals Together differences and similarities, something like that. Really long title, but great book. Um, so it was very bizarre when we started seeing like some of our top guys were going off and they'd graduate. And a couple of years later, you'd hear these rumors that they were Catholic now. And um, we all just thought that was so strange. Um, but I was there, I graduated, I taught for about 10 years at the college and, and the graduate level. And when I started working on my PhD there, a program which I helped start with Richard Howe, um, it gave me a chance to really dig deeper into certain subjects that had kind of been hinted at, but not really dug deep enough during my master's work. And, you know, I, I'd read all of Norm's books on the subjects and stuff, but I knew there was more to it. There, there, there were some issues that I hadn't quite settled in my mind yet that I wasn't seeing really good evangelical responses to. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm working at the PhD level now. I got, I can't have that, you know, I got to be top to bottom. So I started doing a lot of my work on some of these issues and that's when the trouble started. <laughs> <laughs> it was, what interests me with, with SES um, as a whole is it really is intentionally kind of non-denominational, right? That's really, I, it's, it's a, almost like a, a, a movement in a sense, right? It's not tied to a certain denomination or a certain church. It really is trying, it seemed to me, as you described it, to really be trying to, not reinvent the evangelical seminary, but really rise above denominations and kind of be this place where if you really want to do rigorous study, come here. Is, am I getting that right? I mean, is that, is that part of the intention of yeah, I, kind I, of... I, I think that was the idea. Um, of course, you know, when you get in there, it's kind of funny because it, it turns out to be you know, the most denominational, non-denominational entity that I've ever, you know, been a part of. <laughs> uh, we used to joke that if one of our professors ever quit, you know, we'd be in trouble because we need to find another 
you know, Thomistic Baptist dispensational, you know, it's like, well, all three of them are already here. <laughs> so now everybody that teaches there graduated from there. Um, that's, yeah. you know, that's what you end up having to do. Um, but yeah, in theory, the idea was to provide a really solid apologetic, good, solid philosophy of religion uh, to people so that those things could, could start spreading out into the world. Uh, you know, Norm was doing this stuff really before anybody else was. Of course, now it's not that unusual to see apologetics programs in various places. But, you know, typically the, uh, you know, the old guard today were the people who were taught by Norm when they were coming up. So yeah. the guys at Biola and stuff like that. I mean, you know, so we're kind of third generation with SES and, you know, Norm was kind of waning at that point. Um, but we were trying to get apologetics, classical apologetics, orthodox evangelicalism out into the world before everything fell apart. And that was really kind of how we felt our, our mission statement was going to play out in our lives. Interesting. And when these, when these fellow seminarians were becoming Catholic, I mean, you obviously later in your life became Catholic and you collected some of these stories into a fantastic book from Ignatius Press. What, at the time, you, you said there were these rumors and you guys are kind of like, what, that, that's weird, what's going on? Was there, was there a sense of why this was happening as, at, at this school as it was happening before? I mean, because obviously you joined that, as you call it, an exodus in your book. Was there a sense of what was going on at the time? Well, I, I don't think so, because largely what would happen is typically people, you know, when you're in seminary, you're very, very busy. You know, th this was not the kind of school people got scholarships to, you know, this, this wasn't the school that mommy and daddy sent you to, you know, we were all working, you know, we're, I, I mean, my best friend, Jason Reed, who's a, a teacher at a great um, Catholic seminary now who also converted, obviously, um, he was washing windows, you know, the whole time and he's, he's having kids and doing the whole thing. And, and in the meantime, you know, do another 40 hours worth of work every yeah. week, you know, try to get through seminary. Um, so most of these nagging issues, they just, they just had to get swept under the rug. Like I just, I don't have time to think about this right now. Um, I remember one night in particular, and this is still back in the trailer days, one, one of the very first converts that I knew of uh, a guy named Glenn, um, he was out in the parking lot and he was super upset. I mean, people were literally like, Hey, you, you need to go talk to Glenn. He's losing it. You know? So <laughs> I go out there and Jason's talking to Glenn and Glenn's just like beside himself. And what's, what's freaking him out is that all these Protestants have different views of what scripture teaches and you know, how do we reconcile that? Well, we knew that answer, right? Because we, we've been to class with Tom Howe. Well, you know, they don't have good philosophy or they don't have a good hermeneutic. You know, somewhere something went wrong. And then he said, but, but, but even people that have the same hermeneutic don't agree. And even people that have the same philosophy don't agree. Like, like there just doesn't seem to be any way to guarantee any particular interpretation of scripture. So how do you ever know you're right? Um, and my gosh, I, there was like a train of people that came out of the building, talked to Glenn for a while, and then went back in the building and gave up. And uh, he, he'd like dropped out. I mean, he just disappeared very soon after that. Ended up becoming Catholic. He's fine now. Got a PhD, wrote a book. Uh, he's teaching somewhere. Um, but um, he, that was one of the times that really bugged me because the thing he was asking about is kind of the standard issue, right? That, you know, if, if Protestants believe in sola scriptura and the Bible is, you know, the, the highest, at, at least, if not the lone authority, for faith and morals, then what do you do when nobody seems to be able to agree on, on what it teaches? Um, we thought we had the answer because, oh, if you go to SES, you learn the right philosophy and you learn the right hermeneutic, yeah. and you learn the right this, and you know, you get all this stuff. But then even at the school, we had disagreements. You know, there were, you know, even of the three professors, <laughs> you know, who all came up under Norm Geisler and all agreed on practically everything, they still disagreed on things. Um, so that was one of those things that was back there in my head, but you know, it'd be years before I could take the time to really look at it. And, and what I think would happen is that, you know, then Jeremiah Cowart, who is in um, evangelical Exodus, he and Glenn were friends. And so a year or two after Jeremiah uh, left the school, he became Catholic and just every year or so you'd hear a name, you know, and, um, but the thing is, by then they were gone. You know, they, they, they were gone. They were doing their own thing. Maybe nobody even knew them anymore. So you very rarely heard the story. And, and I think this is why this is why I wanted Evangelical Exodus written, because 
by the time my time came around, I had seen a large number of people in a concentrated period of time becoming Catholic. And so the rumors were starting to fly. SES was kind of on the decline. Things were not going well with Norm at all. Um, things were not going well with the school and the new president. Like things were just falling apart. And so when some of the like brightest stars of the seminary started becoming Catholic, it was like damage control time. And, and all these rumors were going around, oh, you know, these secret cabals hiding in the basement of SES, converting to the students. And, and, and I'm sitting there listening to this and, you know, of course I'm going through it too, you know, <laughs> uh, or at least the struggle, you know, I, I quit SES long before I converted just to set the record straight. But I knew these guys, I'd had conversations with these guys. I knew the pain they were going through. I mean, this was terrifying for a lot of us. Um, it wasn't fun. You know, it wasn't, he, 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 we're going to become Catholic and make Norm mad. You know, it, it just wasn't like that at all. You know, like we're, we're looking at ruining our careers, ruining our ministries, not being able to support our families and, and all this time and money that we put into the seminary is just, you might as well just throw your degree away. Right. Um, no, these guys were really legitimately struggling and a lot of our issues were very difficult to deal with and we weren't getting good answers. They weren't getting good answers, but, you know, nobody wanted to hear that. You know, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear that they're just stupid or they just, you know, oh, they just, they read philo too much philosophy and now they're Aquinas. Um, so yeah. So by the time I left and some others left and, and a lot of the conversions had kind of solidified, um, we put evangelical exodus together to just kind of set the record straight. Yeah, because it, it makes sense that the reason why everyone's converting is because they're just dumb or something, right? That's the easy answer. Oh, there's there's a secret cabal meeting in the basement, or there's some kind of something in the water, or some kind of curse on the school, or something bizarre like this making them <laughs> become Catholic, right? Instead of, no, these guys were super serious. Like, it sounds like you guys were really, like, this is a, a, a serious venture, uh, doing your, doing a school at SES. It wasn't for the faint of heart. You were seriously digging into stuff, which is why your friend Glenn's in the parking lot losing his mind when he's digging as deeply as he is, working as hard as he is, and still hitting into these these walls, right? You guys, as scary as it is to, for the evangelical to hear, you guys were serious, and that's why you converted, not because there was something in the water, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there were plenty of things that, that went around, you know, um, and and this this... I don't really feel like it went around. It was just one of those things that, you know, everybody knew one guy, you know? And so when, when those questions started coming yeah. up and those questions that I was working on in my doctorate and, you know, and I'm teaching classes, right. And so I'm getting asked questions too, you know, like I, I'd get done with my story on the canon and try to move on and somebody would raise their hand. Well, you know, who actually decided the canon? I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, just God made it evident. And, you know, all these bumper sticker answers that I knew and yeah. I'd seen on their face, like, I'm not buying this. Um, in fact, I, I remember toward the end, I, I started um, assigning this book um, that was written by an evangelical. Um, and it basically told the real true history of the canon of scripture. And it pretty much finished off by saying, if we don't trust the church, we don't really have a canon. And I remember a student one time, she raised her hand and she said, well, that means it's like really important that we figure out what that church is. And I just went, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, it was funny because as I started moving away from kind of just your standard evangelicalism, you know, I, I stopped off at Anglicanism because, you know, that's just what we do. Um, and you know, I was actually going to the church that the dean of the seminary went to. So this this wasn't like some secretive thing. I mean, he knew I was there. He was going to an Anglican church too, I think because his wife liked it. Um, but I started getting in trouble in my classes because I was teaching Protestant things like maybe infant baptism isn't that bad. And maybe the Catholic church is responsible for the canon. Things that I was learning from evangelical and Protestant scholars. I mean, I wasn't reading Patrick Madrid and Scott Hahn at this point. <laughs> you know, I'm literally learning all of this by reading evangelical Protestant scholars. And what I realized was even a move toward classical Protestantism was being interpreted as me becoming Catholic. Right. And that's when it started to occur to me just kind of how weird of a situation I was really in. <laughs> that, you know, this, this, is, this is not basic mere Christianity. This is, this is very much a denomination. It's got its little, you know, slots filled. And, um, 
yeah, I'm, I'm going to be in trouble if, if I go much further down this road, even if I don't become Catholic or Orthodox, um, I, I could just see, you know, the, the, the time's running out, the sand's pouring through the hourglass, like Doug's not going to make it much longer. And so I, I think like the next year is when I finally, uh, finally had to quit. Yeah. And that's so interesting. So you were beginning to see as you were, this happened as you were beginning to work on your PhD, you began to see that what even evangelical ism was founded on was really not historical Protestantism. It was really even further filled from that. Did that be, kind of begin to, because that's a really, uh, that's a really crazy re recognition or realization, right? Because we think that what we're practicing is the, is the Christian faith that's been handed on since the beginning of Christianity. And you begin to realize that even, even the Protestants who broke away from the Catholic Church were different than what you're doing now. That's kind of shocking because you think you're in, in this lineage and really it's a, as you dig deep, like you say, it looks more and more, it looks less and less like the evangelical Christianity that, that you were looking to be an apologist for, right? Yeah. You know, we were, we were allegedly being taught, you know, pretty basic Christianity. I mean, you know, cause apologetics typically doesn't concern itself too much with theology. That, that's another field. That's another step that that's down the road. Um, and so we would talk about the essentials of the faith and, you know, if, if it didn't have to do with salvation, it was a secondary issue. We can, you know, agree to disagree, but apologetics. Now that is different. That's about defending the basics of the Christian faith. But then you start thinking about it and it's like, well, you know, we don't defend baptism. Um, but the Bible says baptism saves you. <laughs> so that sounds kind of like a essential. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we don't defend, you know, any particular view of, of communion, but Jesus says, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have eternal life. So that sounds kind of salvific. And, and you start to realize like, even what you think is an essential is controlled by your theology. Yeah. And that's, that's the theology you're defending. I mean, the Bible that we defended in the 12 steps, and if anyone you know, knows Norm, they know what the 12 steps are. Uh, it's not the 73 book Bible. <laughs> it's the 66, you know, um, 73, right? Some 70 something. Yeah, sure. Something like that. It's in the seventies. I don't know. I'm Catholic. I don't read the Bible anymore. Um, <laughs> You know, but it's just, it's just so funny that like we defined ourselves as being mere Christianity, like the things that don't concern us yeah. Uh, because yeah, I mean, if I'm going to defend the Bible and I don't even know which, which Bible it is, right. Cause the Bible I'm defending isn't the one that the church started with. Um, it's not the one that most Christians use. So yeah, th those things started really bugging me, you know, that number one, even with all our philosophy and all our hermeneutics and all our Greek and Hebrew and everything else, all these guys are still out there. And there's like an entire publishing empire devoted to disagreeing with each other about doctrine and what the Bible teaches. We can't agree on what the essentials are. Um, I mean, Norm Geisler himself, who was like, probably as far as I know, like the most prolific writer on this very idea of discerning essentials versus non-essentials. I found three different publications where he gave his, uh, methodology for determining the essentials. He came up with a different list every time, <laughs> every time. I mean, yeah. how do you not see that this is a flawed methodology when you apply it three times and you get three different answers? Um, and then, and then just where did the Bible come from at all? Um, so, you know, sola scriptura doesn't work. If you don't know what the Bible is, you don't know where it came from. You don't know how to read it. Um, and, and you're just basically applying what you already think to, to the scripture. And that, that supposedly that's what the Catholics did, right? <laughs> They're the ones who just, you know, they owe the tradition trumps scripture. If you're a Catholic, well, guess what? <laughs> it seems like it does it here too. Yeah. yeah. And that's so interesting. The idea of the essentials, right? Cause this is really, I mean, how, how we used to find churches as an evangelical is you look for the church that is the most biblical church in most cases. I mean, sometimes it's just the music and the people that are there, if, if we're honest about it. But we would say we're looking for the most biblical church often, right? But that really, and for us then, that's how we interpret the Bible, like what we think is biblical. And, and it comes down to these essentials, right? What we think is really important from the Bible that these churches believe, that's the core of Christianity. And you said it before too, this idea that, well, those that don't agree with us, they have their philosophy wrong or their hermeneutic is wrong or they're interpreting something wrong. And 
I, that again comes down, right? And you, you are realizing this as you're teaching at SES, it sounds like, uh, pursuing your PhD. It comes down to what you believe are essential and what you believe is biblical and what you believe that interpretation of, of, of the Bible to be ultimately, right? And that sounds like for you started becoming a bit of a problem. <laughs> Yeah, because that was supposed to be what what the the bad guys did. You know, that, that's what Jehovah's Witnesses do, and that's what Catholics yeah. do. You know, we're just going to the Bible, and um, yeah, it was a real eye opener to realize. Well, no, we're not though, really, because there's all these verses that, on the surface of it, I don't take literally, but I don't see any reason in the text not to take them literally. But if I did, I'd sound Catholic, you know. Um, and, you know, I start looking for all these verses that that allegedly the Catholic Church contradicts Scripture, and it's like, well, but not really. I mean. They certainly, you know, the Catholic Church nowhere contradicts Scripture as much as sola fide contradicts James 2.24. I mean, <laughs> when you just take the not out of a sentence, that's, there is nothing more contradictory than that. <laughs> you know, so here's how, you know, justification is by faith alone. The Scripture says justification is not by faith alone. That there is no more contradictory statement than than putting those two things together. Yeah. But we had a way out of it. You know, oh, no, 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 but you don't understand. Okay, but, you know, whatever you say next doesn't matter because what you're telling me is that even if you contradict Scripture, there's a way to do it that's acceptable. Yeah. And if you can do it, then so can the Catholics and so can the Jehovah's Witnesses, so can everybody. So there has to be something else going on here. Um, and I need to know what that is because... I was an agnostic for this very reason <laughs> back in high school. Now I'm a graduate student. I'm teaching future pastors, current pastors, um, and I'm going to be Dr. Doug Bowman in a couple of years. And I'm starting to realize I'm, I'm basically back to square one. Yeah. You know, like it's taken me all this time to come right back and say, you know what, maybe we just don't know. <laughs> um and, you know, so I started kind of having, you know, my Glenn freak outs in the parking lot. You know, I'm talking to people. But um, fortunately for me, I was surrounded by a bunch of people that were asking the same kinds of questions. And so what did happen off the books is that there was just a lot of coffee shop talk. You know, like, let's get off campus and go over here. We need to hammer this thing out. But again, it wasn't like we were scheming. It was, I really don't know how to answer yeah, this. I feel yeah. stupid, you know, because, like, I'm teaching this. I've got all the same books. I've read everything. Um you know, how do you do? I don't know how to deal with it either. You know, and, and that was the kind of thing we were realizing was we really don't have answers to these things. We just keep being told we have answers. But when it really comes down to it, like nobody is able to answer these questions. Yeah, which which when you're that serious, right, that that in the thick of things that becomes concerning. And again, it wasn't like you guys were just doing this for fun on a lark. This was serious scholarship, really people who chose to be there digging into these things and coming to these conclusions, which should be an alarm bell for other evangelicals, non-Catholic Christians, maybe listening or watching to this, watching this, this show, that people as, as serious as you guys ask these questions and couldn't find answers should really make those questions more important to, to be asking, I think. What did you do next? Like, where did you begin to, to find some answers then? Did you immediately just say, no, there's no, it can't be an answer. I give up. I'm agnostic again. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, <laughs> I, I recognize that I was getting to that point and, and I yeah. needed, needed something that had to change. Um, yeah. So, you know, eventually the nice thing about doing PhD work and teaching is that I was basically getting paid to read, you know, 10 hours a day. Yeah. Like that was my job. <laughs> um, so I was able, you know, I was able to get a hold of the books. I was able to read those books. I was able to discuss these writings. Of course, the internet is out there. This is about the time I discovered Devin Rose. Um, so I did start looking like, okay, I mean, the obvious move here is to become Catholic, just like everybody else, you know? So like, I'm going to go ahead and jump in there, put my toes in there a little bit, um, fully expecting to figure out a way out. Like, I mean, and I think this is something that's important to, um, to point out is that there are people that become attracted to the Catholic church. There are, you know, it's beautiful. It's ancient. It's got the cool smells and bells, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I discovered really quickly that I, I could have all that without becoming Catholic. You know, there's some there's some good high church Anglican places I can go. I've got a fantastic Greek Orthodox church right around the corner. Like, I definitely don't need to go to Rome. You know, I can get all this cool stuff and I can get the sacraments and I can get my questions answered and, and I don't ever have to become Catholic. And I did not want to become Catholic. Um, 
you know, some of the guys in the book, I mean, they really fell in love with the church. I did not. Um, I, I wanted to find a way around it. Um, and honestly, I probably would have converted a year or two earlier um, if I hadn't spent so much time trying not to become Catholic. I mean, it really, you know, <laughs> yeah. I can't stress this enough. Um, I don't talk about this a lot, but I mean, there was a good several years where um, orthodoxy was like, you know, going to be my lifesaver. Like if, if I can't find any other way to stay Protestant, at least I can become orthodox. You know? <laughs> um, so I started reading the Catholics though, because they were really the ones who wrote on these topics. I mean, there wasn't really a whole lot else I could do. And um, I remember um, Jason Reed and I had gone to a, a, a philosophy conference at St. Louis university and we were in the hotel room and I was doing research for my paper on uh, orthodoxy, I think. I can't remember which one it was. One of my big papers that was like this big eye-opening thing for me. And I was Googling around and I found this kind of cool looking website called Call to Communion. And they had like these really scholarly articles. I and mean, I was like, who the heck are these guys? And um, there was one called the Two Quoque. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool because that's a logical fallacy. I teach logic. Let's see what this thing is. Well, it turned out not to be about that. What it was, was, was an, a Catholic answer to what was considered one of the major pushbacks against Catholics, which is namely that just as Protestants are kind of deciding what they believe, and Catholics chide them for that, the Catholics are doing the same thing, because you had to choose whether to believe the church. So really, we're kind of in the same boat. Well, this article, uh, Brian Cross, he, he just tore that argument to shreds. Well... That was the argument that I finished my conversation with Jeremiah Cowart when we had spent a month or two arguing about him becoming Catholic. <laughs> so for years, I'd been writing this wave of, of this final gotcha argument, only to have it destroyed, you know, <laughs> you know, from coming out from nowhere. And I remember I, I swiveled around in my chair and I looked over at Jason and I said, dude, I'm in trouble. <laughs> oh, no. Like, this is really bad. I just had the rug pulled out for me. I mean, I felt like I was in high school again, you know, like, you know, Brian Cross just ate my lunch. Um, <laughs> well, I start digging around on Call to Communion, and I see Andrew Pressler is one of the contributors. And I'm like, Andrew Press, like, I went through seminary with him. So I click, and sure enough, it's guy from SES. Like, not only is he Catholic, but he's writing for this incredible <laughs> website. And... Um, and of course they had stuff on the canon and they had stuff on orthodoxy and just all of the things I had been mulling around. It was just all there laid out, nice, neat, logical arguments, philosophically tight. And uh, yeah, things just went downhill really quick. Um, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just that website, but it was constant confirmation that there really is no answer to the canon problem without the church. There really is no good answer to the orthodoxy problem without the church. And of course, when I say the church, it's that church that existed back then um, that uh, I'm not a part of. <laughs> and, you know, maybe orthodoxy is, is still like, you know, the uh, the escape hatch, but evangelicalism is, is not it. Like, it's, it's not, not yeah. it. Yeah. And so that's that's about the time when, when I finished out the year, um, they offered me some classes for the fall. And, and fortunately other things had started happening with the school that were pretty bad and I wanted out anyway. So it was kind of a convenient time. Um, we were, we were kind of breaking up, you know, how you just sort of know when you're breaking up. Yeah. <laughs> so I just didn't renew my contract. I didn't make a big deal out of it. Didn't storm out or anything. I just quietly didn't accept any classes. And, um, I talked to the guys about the PhD. I said, listen, I think I'm gonna have to bow out. I don't think this is working out. I don't, I don't want to get my PhD from here. Um, and then went and found a job and, uh, spent several years, you know, finishing off the studies. And then, uh, in 2016, well, 2015, I guess I, I decided to start RCIA and we had a really great Catholic parish. It's where all the SES people went when they became Catholic. And, <laughs> um, yeah, I started the, the program there cause I figured, well, if, if I, if I can't get through RCIA and find a way out, then it's pretty much over. Yeah. So that was, that was 2015. So several months after officially not accepting any more contracts with SES, um, I started RCIA and I came into the church the next Easter. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I think a number of things are jump out at me. The, the first is that you couldn't find answers to these things in evangelical Christianity, or you can't find answers to 
where did the Bible come from? How can we how can we trust it? You can't find answers to how can the church uh, express a certain orthodoxy if we can't all adhere to the same the same kind of uh, ideas of what that means, right? And all kinds of different issues I can think of there. You can't find those answers. I mean, for me, scripture and tradition was was the catalyst for me. I was I was working at a interning at a Protestant student church, evangelical student church, non denominational, one summer between between degrees. And the pastor who was doing his master's degree and who was raised Catholic was wrestling with the, the tradition that he was brought up in. And now he was pastoring this non-denominational church. And he said to me, what's more important, the Bible or tradition? And I didn't realize at the time that he was wrestling through this question for himself in his own uh, <laughs> studies. That for, me, it was, for me, it was out of, out of left field. And I thought, well, of course it's the Bible. But then he goes, well, where did the Bible come from? Like, who put the Bible together? Isn't that tradition? Didn't doesn't the tradition say what books belong, what books don't? Like, isn't isn't that in some ways an arbiter of how we got the scripture? And that for me, Doug, was like head explode, right? And I began. I had to look into where this tradition was and where it came from, and then I, the whole the whole canon thing. Like you said, I found what what you found at a much simpler level. I wasn't doing I wasn't doing PhD studies, but like you said, there really aren't good answers. And I've and you have probably done the same thing now too. I listened to I listened to debates for hours and hours of debates, read all kinds of things. I still can't find a, a really good answer on on how we trust the Bible from an evangelical perspective. Right? Those answers are found in the Catholic Church, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, and and a lot of this for me was that you know I'd already read Norman Geisler's book, you know, I knew his co-author. Like I knew these guys. You know, th- this this was not like I just went and found a book somewhere. Like I had studied, you know, with this with this man. I'd helped him write his systematic theology. You know, I'd used his bathroom, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it, yeah. Yeah, you know, so you know at that point, um you know, I, I had lived and breathed evangelicalism for 20 years as an apologist, like not just, you know, oh, I go here because my parents I like I there was I haven't spent one day in Christianity that wasn't as an adult intentionally, yeah. you know, um, going for it and, and doing the Christian thing. So um, th- this was no different. You know, the, it's funny. I, I, I did a little thing on my um, YouTube channel about this evangelical professor becoming Catholic. And, you know, I started getting to come some of the comments, Oh, this guy was never saved in the first place. And I, and just like that, it, that just almost makes me laugh because number one, I get it. I know that's like the standard answer, but I'm sitting there thinking, well, buddy, I, I probably trained your pastor, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he probably got a B, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> it's like, I, I don't know how you could be more, I mean, you know, to kind of riff on St. Paul, you know, like I was an evangelical of evangelicals, yeah. you know, um, yeah. You know, I'm teaching at like one of the the greatest evangelical seminaries. I mean, I'm getting published, you know, and I'm not making any money. So it's not like I was just riding, you know, this big wave of of popularity or anything. Yeah. It just no, you know, I, I don't know how I could be any more <laughs> truly, you know, um, and concernedly evangelical than I was. Um, so yeah, you know, I I read those guys. You know, I I didn't I I read. Geisler's book over and over again. I, and, and it was evangelicals who were convincing me that it wasn't going to work because um, especially some of these, uh, they, they, there was a series that came out called the resourcement series. I think the editor was, was this guy out of Baylor. Um, but they have the, you know, they have scripture and tradition. They have um, the canon book. I can't remember what it's called. That's the one that I assigned in, in my new Testament class. Um but they're all just basically admitting the facts. And I think that was really the difference is that they were willing to admit the facts and then try to find some way to make the facts not lead where it seemed like they were leading. And, um, you know, like I said, I actually got in trouble because like the Canon book that I assigned, there just was no answer, you know, mm-hmm. like they'd get to the end of the book and then they'd, well, what's the answer? I said, well, the answer is the church. I mean, like, I don't know. You tell me, <laughs> you know? I'm going to my students now, you know, somebody has the answer. Anybody, um, you know, I took a class from Michael Kruger. He's pretty much got like the top book on the canon from a, a Protestant perspective. And, uh, you know, he kind of turns it into like an ingredient type thing where all these, con- all these uh, converging lines come together and you have the canon, but you know, the church tradition is a big, is a big one of those. Um, and, and the trouble is the other ones 
don't get you the the Protestant canon. <laughs> right. You know, you you remove the church from the process. And, well, you know, the, the Holy Spirit has to confirm it in your heart. Well, why didn't the Holy Spirit confirm these other books that the church preached on for centuries? Um, why didn't the Holy Spirit confirm Revelation for centuries in the East? Um, you know, why was it so hard to get certain books in? And um, yeah, like the canon history is just a big mess. <laughs> you know, it's not clean or pretty at all. And and so you kind of want to go, well, if the Holy Spirit did that, I mean, that's like, I mean, I don't want to sound mean or, you know, impious, but like, it doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit did a very good job. You know? <laughs> I mean, when the Holy Spirit needed to teach people about the Trinity, you know, it's like, that just isn't the way God seems to work. He doesn't just magically make all the Christians agree on stuff. They they fight and they they debate and they have to have councils and I mean this is in scripture right I mean in the in the book of Acts in chapter fifteen you have all of these pastors quote unquote um, and Christians getting together to debate what what today seems completely obvious to us <laughs> you, know, they, you know whether or not you have to become Jewish to be a Christian that was like a live debate for the apostles you know one thing that always cracked me up about that council is, you know, you have all these guys arguing about, about this, this debate. And then it's like Peter and Paul show up and I'm thinking that would have been the end of it, right? Like, oh, good. Peter and Paul are here. You know, like they've taken a break from writing the Bible <laughs> <laughs> to come to our council. Um, you know, we could just ask them, but they didn't, you know, they just gave testimony and then there was like a vote and, yeah. and you just kind of go, I believe that the Holy spirit was over that. But what the Holy Spirit was over was this messy human situation that uh, that just doesn't have a nice way to reverse engineer it. And it's the same thing with the Trinity, and it's the same thing with the Incarnation. It's the same thing with the canon. Um, I do believe that the Holy Spirit was over the process of the whole thing, that the outcome was guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Um, but, but to make it sound like that process was synonymous with just sort of feeling the Bible out, you know, um, sorry, sorry, Calvin, it just, no, <laughs> I, I realize that that's the best you've got. Um, but it's, it's just, it just flies in the face of, of the facts to me. Um, it just seems to make a lot more sense that God guided the church in general. We can trust the outcome and whether, whether it was, you know, throwing dice for who was going to replace Judas or whether it was some big council with the apostles there, Whatever they did, God superintended it so that it worked. Um, but to try to make throwing dice and <laughs> you know arguing with the apostles um, some kind of inner you know message, it just it just doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah, yeah, and I think so many evangelicals I did for sure took the Bible for granted. This is the book; it's handed to me. It's all bound and table of contents is there. Sure. It's all a nice package. I mean, first of all, you realize that your Bible is missing some books that were there, that were there and that were affirmed to be in there for the first many, many, many years of, of Christianity. That's a little alarming, right? To think those books have been been removed, but then to to actually question how it got put together, right? And then I think too to question how we agree on, okay, so if we just leave that aside and say, okay, the Bible is what it is, it's God put it together, let's just use this to figure out what we believe, or at least as you said, the, the, the chief way of knowing that, the primary source of knowing what we believe, what happens when you disagree, right? That becomes then the secondary issue of how do you determine whose interpretation of this thing is the right interpretation, right? It's just, it's a, it's a non, it's a static kind of thing. We say that the word of God is living, and of course we believe that it is, but when it comes to this verse here versus this verse here, deciding which one and how to interpret these, right? But that becomes an issue apart from some kind of authority that put it together in the first place, right? Right, yeah, because you know, the, the very tool that we're supposed to be using to adjudicate these matters is actually the thing that's causing them. <laughs> you know, we, we wouldn't have this disagreement if scripture didn't have a verse for you and a verse for me that both seem to teach what we think is true, but we disagree on. Um, you know, it would be very easy if, if there were no Arminian verses and there were only Calvinist verses. You know, it'd be very easy if there were only dispensational and no covenant verses. Um, no, it's the source material itself that's causing these problems. And, and I have no doubt that there is a way to work it all out. But what I definitely don't agree with is that we can figure out which one of those there is. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like having a puzzle that's, you know, all one color 
and half the pieces fit with each other, no matter which way you turn them. You know, it's like everybody can make the puzzle, <laughs> but how can we possibly argue that my way of making the puzzle is better than your way when they both work? Um, yeah, so I, I just think this uh, this idea that somewhere out there you can finally reach the end and you'll know for sure that, that you're right, that's why everybody ends up punting to the Holy Spirit, right? Because objectively it's not there. I mean, there's a reason that that these these publishers, you know, can can put out two or three dozen debate books, each with three to five different views from you know good, pious scholars, you know, that, that all disagree with each other. Yeah, it's just it, that's just the way it is. You know, it it just isn't simple to read this book and come up with this really heavy duty theology. And it seems like you've only got two choices: either either you just accept everybody's. In which case, why do we have Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and people like this that, that are cults? You know, they're not Christian, they're cults. Um, or you just say my way or the highway to everybody, in which case there shouldn't be any denominations. You know, every denomination should just be Christianity and that's it. Well, of course, we call them cults too, right? <laughs> so you got cults on either side. Um, and, and the only people that are acceptable is, is whoever agrees with your essentials and says it's okay to disagree on the non-essentials. And as long as our essentials lists match, well, then we're okay. Um, but again, you've just pushed the problem back one now because the essentials, th there's no way to make that objective essentials list. You know, the, the Bible isn't color coded you know, with uh, this is the essential one and this isn't. And, yeah. and it's just so funny too, because I, I think about the things that used to be, seem obvious to me, you know, like the essentials thing seem to be really obvious, but, but again, it, it's like what you said with the Bible, it's what you're handed, you know, I'm handed the Nicene creed. Okay. But the Nicene creed talks about baptism. So <laughs> how is that not an essential? Um, you know, and if you, Oh, well, you just, we're just going to limit it to the things that, that are salvation. Well, objectively speaking, the Bible says certain things about salvation that you're not counting as uh, as essential. So it just, when you can get far enough back, I think, to um, to sort of see both sides, it, it just became really obvious really quick that both sides have problems, but one of them is causing their own problems. You know, one of them is trying to put forth a methodology and a worldview that ends up getting them in trouble. Um, the other side is at least coherent. <laughs> Maybe they're wrong, but they're at least coherent. You know, um, this church says that the church decided what was in the canon. And you look back in history, and that is an objective fact. That's what they did. Now, there might be another layer of spirituality on that. There might be another layer of, of God's causality on that. But you can't deny what actually happened. And that is what actually happened. Nobody sat around and said, here's the essentials, you know, and we're going to put them in the Nicene Creed. You know, nobody sat around and said, okay, all of these books were written by an apostle and approved by the church and the Holy Spirit told me, da, 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 okay, and then there's the 66 books magically. Um, that's just not what happened. Um, it's not what happened. So I, I just, I feel like the reality of the situation was just that I, I was not looking at how things work in reality correctly. And it seemed like the ones that were, were the Catholics. Yeah. And just, I mean, just lo looking at this, very objectively. I mean, I think I read a blog article early on in my conversion. I think I was just brand new, brand new Catholic, or maybe I'm not even Catholic at this point. I was just blogging for myself and some friends trying to work out my own headspace, what I was thinking and, and, and doing, looking at the Catholic Church. Or this article called Processism is a System Designed to Fail. Because what I was processing in my head is like, look, there's no way this system of, of unity, we, we can't be united around the Bible because the book is divisive in its nature. If this, if the system is, we look at the Bible, interpret it, and that's when we know what Christianity is, and we follow that, it can't work, because we're all going to, we're going to disagree on different things on the essentials. We're going to disagree on what, what essential lists we come up with, because some say baptism is essential, some say that baptism is not essential, some say that salvation is the, the key thing, and everything else is, then yeah, what's in that, what is uh, packaged up in the idea of salvation? Like, we can't, we can't agree. And I came to realize that and, and, and kind of hit a dead end in evangelical Christianity because I realized that the system that I was following, we, we could not find unity in that system unless the Holy Spirit just came down and, and just wiped us all out and just imparted to us what the essentials were. We were never going to agree because even those churches seeking after those things end up splitting apart 
on on different issues, right? And it's 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 what we call the non-essentials. But the problem there, as you're laying out for us, is that well, what are those essentials versus non-essentials? And we can't even agree on that. So I mean, to say, as I'm sure you did, and I used to say, like we're we're all we're all Christians, we're all the body of Christ. We all agree on the essentials. We would say that so often if people would ask why we're not united but then we can't agree on what the essentials were and that right there is is a broken system to me if i can if i can put it i mean that sounds really really harsh but that's what i hit up against this this, this broken system doug yeah <laughs> yeah i remember talking to a buddy of mine about some of the things that were going on and um i i said essentially what you just said that you know that this isn't this isn't a problem for evangelicalism that this just is evangelicalism yeah. like it's it's yeah. making its own problems um it's it's in the attempt to make evangelicalism fit the facts and um and and make sense within itself that you start to see the, the issues and it's yeah they're, they're being caused by the system that is in place um, this isn't really something from the outside. It's not an outside attack. It's just, yeah, this just really deeply at some point doesn't make sense. And again, you can go years and years and years without realizing this because there's always somebody smarter than you. You know, there's always a book you haven't read somewhere yeah. out there is that answer. And, you know, I, I admit, you know, and I've got good friends that are not Catholic, you know, that, that went through this whole kind of same thing that I did. They we've had all the conversations, um, yeah, not everybody has the time, you know, not everybody has five years to read every single day um, and, and bounce ideas off of extremely smart evangelicals that like, if I don't find the answers here, that there just aren't any, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I got to do that for five years. Um, so, you know, I still hear the bumper stickers. I still hear the, uh, you know, just the real surface level. Oh, well, this. It's like, okay, you know, g give yourself a few years. If, if you keep thinking about this, you're going to realize why that answer doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like we talked about in the, in the conversion episode, um, at some point, something has to bother you. There has to be some anomaly that you go, wow, I really can't account for that in my system before you can open your eyes to anything else. And, and so I, I just think, yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying I've arrived. I mean, who knows? Maybe I'm still wrong and there's a, you know, another conversion down the road somewhere. Yeah, that's a cult. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, yeah, just when, when I hear those responses and I just go, okay, you know, you have, you have this much, you know, you're here. I get it. I was there for 20 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to tell you the next thing, you know, here's why that doesn't work. Well, oh, you know, okay. Just, I'm not trying to slam you. I'm not trying to make you feel stupid. It's just, yeah, I've been there. I've had those conversations so many times. I tried with all my heart to not become Catholic, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, eventually you just kind of have to, you got to follow the the truth. You know, you got to follow the the facts as you find them. And, you know, this is where I, I was led. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've got a really good friend, even evangelical friend, who we were in college together, and, and I know him and his family very, very well, and I converted, he he, he didn't, he's evangelical still, and we have a really good argument every two or three years, a real knockdown, <laughs> dragging out argument on this every two or three years, and then, and then we cool off and come back again like two years later and, and have a different <laughs> one again. And, and like you said, I mean, the last conversation that we had was on the idea of how do you interpret scripture? And I said, like, look, look at John 6, read John 6, come back and tell me what, how you interpret that. Because I'll tell you how we interpret it as Catholics and how the very first Christians interpreted it, looking at the early church fathers, how they interpreted it. Look how Paul interprets it in, in the Bible. I mean, it seems pretty obvious that Christ is speaking literally about his, his body and blood. And the response that he came back with a few days later was, well, look, if you interpret it using this verse over here, then it can just mean that Christ is speaking about his crucifixion and his resurrection, how he that must, we must imbibe in his resurrection to have life. And, and I said, yeah, but who chooses what verse you use to interpret this verse with, right? The <laughs> idea that the Bible interprets itself is you looking at another, another and this was the idea, like the Bible interprets itself. That was kind of the hermeneutic that he approached this with, and which I would have uh, believed as well as, sure. as evangelical, right? That, the sense. Bible is is se is self sufficient, is coherent amongst itself. But then I said, well, yeah, but what verse or what other verse are you using to interpret this verse? Because I can I can tell you how the very first Christians interpreted this. They were the closest to Christ and his apostles, and and they didn't use those verses to interpret this. This wasn't like a special key that unlocked this. 
and and we fought a bit more and, and kind of left it there. But right there's there's all there's always a way to kind of answer these questions, like you say. But you have to begin to realize that actually there are other ways of answering these questions that that might cohere a bit better, make a bit more sense. But not everybody is going to be there right away, right? You have to begin to see, as we talked about 100 episodes ago when you first came on this podcast talking about the paradigm shifts. 100 episodes ago, that's real. That's wow. real which is crazy. <laughs> it, you have to begin to see these these kind of things, right? These kind of chinks in the armor or kind of little, little you know, a, a pebble in your shoe or something as you're going along the road to begin to unwind these things you you had time you said to read and read and read and ask these of the top of the the brightest guys that you knew which which if i were hearing you say that as an evangelical still i would go wait this guy did all that work and and really couldn't find the answers like that concerns me a little bit <laughs> so i think it should concern some <laughs> listeners who aren't who who are on that that pathway right but we have god does that sometimes right we can just say things and suggest things but there's got to be a move into the spirit to, to move you along that sure. road i think right ultimately yeah. Yeah. yeah and i think it's important to point out that when when you and i are saying we couldn't find answers i i, I don't mean that i wasn't given answers <laughs> i was given plenty of yeah. answers yeah. um like i said i you know i knew norm personally i took a class with michael kruger i read his book yeah i know what those answers are um the issue is they didn't they weren't satisfactory they didn't work you know, the, the problem remains even after you assert this answer. Um, so there were some evangelicals that wrote and they kind of admitted it like, yeah, this is actually a problem. We're not really sure what to do. But like, I love the resourcement guys, um, you know, because they're all these like Baptists, but they're smart enough and, and they and they know who they're writing for and they know that they're going to get clobbered if they say something, you know, they, they can't just this isn't just for the choir, you know, uh, <laughs> And yeah, just some of these books just sort of trail off at the end. Like, yeah, this seems like this. Anyway, you know, <laughs> stay tuned for our next volume. Um, but yeah, it's just when when the answers are given, it's like, well, okay, but there's still this other problem over here. Okay. And then, you know, another answer is given. Yeah, but there's still this problem over here. Um, so th that's really what the experience was like. It, it wasn't that I just had all these evangelicals baffled, you know, and nobody could answer me. Oh, because I was had these great. No, it wasn't like that at all. Everybody had an answer, but none of them were good. I mean, they just weren't good enough. Um, so, yeah, I just um, I, I don't really know how to help people other than to just have the conversations that I had. You know, like okay, let me tell you how this conversation goes because I know the next six steps already. You know. <laughs> And, you know, right now you're at step four. Okay. Well then I say this, Oh, okay. Get back to me in a month and we'll move on to seven, you know? Um, but yeah, when, when it never gets past a certain point, I mean, that, that becomes kind of terrifying. I mean, I, I remember when I was still in the shift and, you know, I'd heard the same thing three or four times. Like I, I'm at the top of my ladder here. Like there, there isn't anybody higher to appeal to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm talking to guys that have been, you know, doctors for decades and, you know, they were the ones that taught me, you know, apologetics and philosophy. And I'm just getting these weak answers. Like just, this is just, I get it. Not everybody studies these things and that's fine. You know, I mean, I was in the midst of all this study, so I don't expect everyone to just, you know, suddenly recall everything they've ever read, but it's like, wow, you, you've been kind of scooting along your whole life on that, you know, <laughs> like, did it never occur to you that there's this like glaring problem? Oh, you know, um, yeah, it happens. You know, we're all human. And it, it took me a really, really long time to get to where I could confidently say, like, I, I really think I've read the best. Like, nobody has given me anything that is supposedly better than this answer. You know, Kruger's book is supposedly the very best on the canon. Geisler's book supposedly the very best on Catholicism. I'm reading these resourcement guys. I'm reading, you know, whoever comes in all these multiple debate books. And uh, yeah, it's like, Rome, sweet home. You know, it's all there. <laughs> I remember the first time I read Scott Hahn's uh, Rome, sweet home. I took notes. I underlined, highlighted, made an index in the back, blah, blah, blah. Didn't move me one bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the second time I picked it up years later, I was like, holy cow. Like if he's been reading my blog, you know, um, he's got all the arguments and they're all here and, and he's right. You know, these haven't been answered. 
Yeah, yeah. It just depends on on where you are, right? On that on that journey. Yeah, and and what people think about too. I I love that you mentioned that too because these guys who study these things for years and years and on top of their game and haven't thought of these things. I remember bringing like Matthew eighteen, where Christ talks about the nature of the church and how you sell, solve disagreements. I think it's Matthew eighteen. Yeah. And uh, to my pastor at my non denominational church and saying, look, how do we solve this problem? Because it looks like Jesus is saying here that if we disagree, bring this to the church. And if we can't come to agreement, then then I am outside of the church, outside of the orthodoxy, outside of what 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 the Christian practice is. But how does that work? Because I can go down the street to a different church that agrees with me. I'm still in the church. Like, how do you? So my question was, how do you ever solve disagreements in the body of Christ? If Jesus says, you know, if the church says no to you, you're out. But I but I can't because I just make my own church or find a church that that says yeah. yes to me. There's no like you know what I mean. There's, there's no. That's when you said there's no real standard of orthodoxy amongst the Christian church, and, and there just there couldn't be just logistically. And he said, yeah, I don't know, was his response. And here I was really, really ready to, like, have wisdom imparted to me. And the answer was, yeah, I don't know. And I was just so floored that somebody that, right, I, I thought, gee, have I found, like a, have I found a problem in, in the Protestant church that nobody else thought of it before? <laughs> nobody like thought of this. Yeah. <laughs> But but not everybody is on the same journey that, that, that we're on at the same time we are and yeah. thinking of these same things. And for a lot of – it's just the water you swim in for a lot of people, right? It was for me, for you, for for ages. This is just the way it was with all these denominations and with wrestling through Scripture and having to read the best authors all the time to stay on top of what the most recent theological kind of trend or agreement was on this or how do we interpret Paul this decade, right? I mean – that was the water we swam in, but to realize that there's a whole other way of doing this that really solves a lot of these problems a lot more eloquently, historically and and logically. Gosh, like sign me up, right? And yeah. we both yeah. converted. So yeah, yeah you know, I, I I don't. It's not like there are no remainder issues in Catholicism, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but for me, when I talk to people, I just I just keep coming back to this. Like, this is the problem you have to solve before I can care about that. You know, like, yes, I get it. There's there's Vatican II and this and that. And what did Francis say yesterday? And, you know, on and on and on it goes, right? But it's like, okay, but first of all, I was Protestant for 20 years. And I, I can tell you right now, <laughs> there's, there's definitely as much, if not worse, stuff going on in Protestantism. So that's just kind of like, you, you know, level playing field. Um, but I, I can't worry about exactly what the church teaches about Mary or exactly what the church believes merit means. Like none of that even concerns me. If you can't tell me where the Bible came from and how we know that it teaches something like solve that problem. And then we can talk all you want <laughs> about, you know, some of the things that, that really, I think that's deep down what really bothers people. Right. You know, they don't want to be Catholic because they don't want the statues. They don't want to have to deal with, with certain things in history that they think they know. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's just weird. You know, like Catholicism, just weird. That's how I started off my, my book, you know, Catholicism yeah. is weird. I love um, but yeah, when you're in it, when you're in Protestantism, when you're in evangelicalism, you don't realize like you're totally weird too. You, you just don't think you're weird because you're, you're used to it. <laughs> um, Catholics have different weird things, but, but so do you. Um, and, and at least with Catholicism, I'm starting on something that looks like a real foundation. You know, I can justify why I believe the Bible. I can justify why I believe the church to teach orthodoxy. And then we can talk about what happened later. We can talk about 1054. We can talk about 1517. We can talk about all these other things. But until somebody comes along and explains how I can, you know, you know, foundationally justify my trust in scripture and my trust in orthodoxy, there, there's just nowhere to go from there. Um because everybody's got the secondary and the tertiary issues that they have to deal with. Yeah. Um, but until we can get the primary stuff out of the way, I don't really know where else to go. <laughs> Absolutely. Doug, it's always a pleasure to have you on this show every time. I think of things I'd have you back to talk about later on. It's make, make a an ongoing, a running list of things we could talk about, and it's it's long. It's numerous. So <laughs> Please so do. We, I love yeah, it. It's we should again. Where can people go to uh, to find your books, to watch your videos, to learn more about you? You have all kinds of stuff you, you're, you're doing and have produced and written. So <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot out there. Um, if you just go to DouglasBeaumont.com, um, 
Doug Beaumont is my name, but I go by Douglas in writing because Doug Beaumont is a realtor and he took my domain name. We won't give it back. Uh, so DouglasBeaumont.com. That's kind of the hub for everything. You can get to YouTube from there. You can get the books from there, um, or at least they're, they're linked to wherever you can buy them from. And um, that's also where I, I still do some writing and that kind of thing. Um, but whatever, whatever happens, it ends up on that website. Yeah. Yeah. It's great stuff. All, as always, a pleasure having you here, Doug. I want to say God bless you. God bless the work you're doing for the church. And, and thank you so much for, for your time once again. You bet. Anytime. <laughs> Sounds fantastic. <laughs>